Hello, this is Digital Accessibility, the people behind the progress. I'm Joe Walensky, the creator and host of this series. And as an accessibility professional myself, I find it very interesting as to how others have found their way into this profession. So let's meet one of those people right now and hear about their journey. All right, well, here we are with another episode where I get the opportunity to chat with an accessibility practitioner. And today I am pleased to be visiting with Merrill Evans. Hello, Merrill. how are you today? Hi, Joe, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. How are you today? Everything is off to a pretty good start and I am in my home office of Vashon Island, which is near Seattle's uh, which is in your Blinks Seattle headquarters office. Uh, where are you talking to us from? Well, I am talking to us, talking to everyone from Plano, Texas, which is right by Dallas. We're having beautiful weather right now. So it's fall and it's a busy time of the year for so many people. Well, uh, you certainly have a long resume of activities uh, within the uh, accessibility community and, and with your work, but you're probably the best person to uh, introduce yourself maybe to people that have not met you yet. So tell us a little bit about the work that you're involved with. So I'm self-employed at mirror.net where I'm a professional speaker, trainer, and accessibility marketing consultant who was certified professional Accessibility Core Competency, CPAC for short. As a speaker, I talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion with a focus on people with disabilities and accessibility. On the consulting side, I work with marketing and communication leaders to ensure their department create accessible content. And I work with companies to help them improve their accessibility and disability inclusion efforts. So I was born hearing for a real medical term profoundly that it came with this accent. So I grew up learning how to speak and love read. Many people assume I know some language and I don't, but it's not a good thing or a bad thing. It just is, it's what works for me. Well, uh, we'll definitely make some links to your uh, TEDx talk that, that you've done and you're very uh, visible uh, online, but all of this had to start somewhere. So uh, why don't you take me back in time and talk about how accessibility first speak, uh, was something that you became aware of in your lived life or work life, and then we can kind of uh, move forward and see how you uh, how you found your way into this profession. I've known about accessibility for years and I wish I had gotten into it sooner. We know how we all wish we could change something in the past. The reality is if we could do that, the outcome could be very different. We won't stop playing the what if game here. Anyway, in 2018 and 2019, I started making videos about high quality captions. They caught the attention of the organizers at an accessibility conference. They invited me to speak. And that was that, that was that. I felt like I finally found my place and decided I want to work in accessibility. I wasn't sure how, but I was on a mission to figure it out. Meanwhile, as a result of appearing at the conference, I got another speaking opportunity and a snowball into many more speaking opportunities, including TEDx. I never dreamed of being a speaker or a trainer because I was realistic. I knew I had an accent and it could be a problem. All these invitations proved otherwise. Anyway, eventually the owner of an accessibility consulting firm reached out as he saw my writing on LinkedIn. I originally started out doing marketing for them 
And I also studied empathic DAM to get my accessibility certification. So now I do client projects as an accessibility consultant. Well, I, um, you're, you're certainly very uh, busy and visible today uh, in this work. Um, it had this been a uh, career change for you? Uh, you know, what what were you involved with before you got into your most recent work? I was I've been self-employed in two thousand and five, and my focus was writing and digital marketing. So I was able to use the digital marketing to help me break into accessibility. And so, and I'm pretty sure I was doing both, and I still do both. But, but I'm hoping to do more on the accessibility side because that's what I love, that's my passion, advocating for people with disabilities and accessibility is keeps me going every single day. And um, what, how, uh, how did it uh, move forward for you to uh, educate yourself about the you know, the various parts of accessibility that we use uh, on a professional basis? Uh, were there certain uh, communities that you got involved with or certain places that you looked for information? Um, how did that work for you? Well, when I share content on LinkedIn, I consider myself a student, simply sharing what I learn. So I learn every day from other accessibility accessibility leader and influencer. So that could be on Twitter, that could be on LinkedIn, that could be just reading articles online that I find through various resources. I think I always want to be learning and applying that and sharing that with others because we can't expect to know it all. There is so much in accessibility to learn. That's why we have this short progress over perfection with the accessibility I kind of know. Because people get so overwhelmed at the thought of accessibility. Where do I start? That kind of that kind of thing. I just don't know. And I'm like, just take that first step. It doesn't have to be big. And sometimes you take two steps back, and that's okay. You just keep moving forward and keep learning. I mean, it takes a lot to build a completely a culture of inclusion that thinks about accessibility for everyone. Don't forget your own employees, not just your customers and your vendors, but your own employees. So it's progress of perfection. Well, uh, yeah, I'm glad you brought up the uh, part about uh, our own employees, because I think sometimes in uh, digital accessibility, we're focused on supporting our customers and clients and external facing, uh, yet within a lot of our own organizations, we don't provide the tools and technologies and processes and, and culture, as you mentioned, for uh, the if, for uh, us to, for everyone to be able to participate regardless of their uh, physical challenge. That's very true. I have heard stories, people reach out to me and they share the story they have a disability, but they don't feel supported in their company. Almost like they hire them to check off the box. We hire somebody with a disability, but we didn't get them the support they need. We didn't give them the tools they need to thrive in the world and the tools they need to grow in their career. So they just put them in their desk and that, that, and you can't do that. that that's just not fair to anyone. People with disabilities have so much to offer. If you would just give them a chance, get to know them. The, because we've been excluded, so long and for so much of our lives, it's that exclusion that has given us the lived experience to come up with creative solution, innovative solution, work around, and that kind of thinking you just can't get with someone who hasn't had that adversity in their lives. Well, it, it, now that you've been working as a consultant in accessibility, 
Um, what are some of the areas that you find that you most often have to address? Are there any particular issues or challenges that come up regularly that you have to solve for uh, your clients? Actually, no, it's been like it's pretty spread out. I mean, it could be on some, in some situation. It can be making sure you have accessibility for your own people. That's a big one. Oh, another big one is so many people, when they think about accessibility, they're thinking about digital accessibility. But accessibility is also physical, in-person, non-digital, and that's why I, call, I just wrote an, an article called 360 Degree Accessibility. And too often companies have, the way they have their organization chart, tech, the tech team was siloed. And so they don't think about the physical side of things. And the physical side of things like customer support, customer service, is siloed away from the digital side. So we've got to find a way to bring it all together and think about the full circle. I love to tell the story. I've told it so many times. People probably <laughs> thought uh, reciting it with me. Um, when I had to get my first COVID test, I was able to make the appointment online, no problem. But I'm sighted, so I don't have those barriers. But it was not until I got to the pharmacy that I've lived by for more than 20 years that I ran into a barrier. You had to go through drive through for testing. And there were so many things wrong with that. First of all, there was a window and it was reflecting the outside so you couldn't see them. Um, and then they were talking to me through a speaker and with the mask on. So every barrier possible. So meanwhile, I heard a story from someone else who wanted to do the drive through testing, but they told her she had to come in. She had a mobility disability and she wanted to drive through. Then a third person with another disability, he's blind and he could not make his own appointment online. So we have three people with three different disabilities all having a different barrier in one process and that's to get COVID testing. I like your term that you used about 360 degrees accessibility. That's a, a very interesting way to think about it. And uh, it, it, most of the people that I interview on this program are, their, their focus is on the digital accessibility, but we have had several people uh, where their products also are distributed and physical environments, and they're also responsible for internal accessibility. And so uh, I think uh, your idea about the 360 degrees is good for all of us to just look around our own, our own world and see what is, it, you know, we may be missing that we can contribute to. Yeah, the little things make a huge difference. There was a time when I was um, I went online for chat for the Perot, text the Perot for your online chat. And the first thing they asked me was, can you give us a callback number in case we get disconnected? I'm like, I would prefer not to do that because that's not the best way to contact me. And I submitted a suggestion to the company to add a second option. So that's the other thing I'm trying to push for is always offer at least two modern communication option or input, input as well. So the next time I'm contacted tech support, they asked me, do we get a callback phone number or email address? Problem solved, so that was great. So we need to offer multiple options because not everybody wants to default to the most common one. Well, you have already mentioned a lot of things uh, that we can, you know, look to uh, Im improve, but I always like to check in to see if there are any particular issues that you feel need to be addressed by accessibility professionals, maybe things that we haven't paid enough attention to, 
or possibly just things that you're particularly excited to work on looking into the future. So any and all of those uh, that you would like to comment on? Well, I like to start small because I think when you show how the smaller things make the bigger difference, it gets people excited because a simple solution so that two communication is a big one. Uh, so often, when we fill out form, they ask for a phone number. But they don't, they don't give us the opportunity to say, hey, text me, don't call me. And I can't tell you how many times I put my phone number in and I get a phone call, which is what I don't want. So we just, it's okay to make the contact feel required. Just give us choices. One airline made me so happy when I was filling out my, getting my ticket, and they gave me a choice of email, text, or automated phone call. That was wonderful because it felt, the little thing, it felt like I didn't have to stress at all that they could possibly call me. My poor spouse, I give out his phone number far more than my own because they kept calling me. So I'm a big girl, I would like to handle my own communication. So it's very empowering when you make those small changes. And uh, looking forward to the future for you, uh, I assume you'll do more consulting work, but are there any uh, uh, other special activities that uh, you might be getting involved with in the future? Well, I just, I just joined the board in my local community. I'm very excited about that. And we have a diversity advocacy committee. It's a mouthful, isn't it? And I'm really excited about that because I, was the, I am one other person with the first people with disabilities in the program. At, at least that they know about, because we know a lot of disabilities are not apparent, right? So because of that, they established the committee to make sure that all underrepresented groups are thought about and that we make our experiences inclusive. So it's very, that this is a volunteer thing. So it's very exciting to see my local organization thinking about their and wanting to make change for the better. So it just makes me happy to know that they care and, and it makes it possible. It is possible for other organizations to adopt the same thinking. It doesn't mean you have to go out and spend lots of money, that's not the case. A lot of things that can be done to create an inclusive organization don't cost anything or very little, and it's worth it. So that's the thing I'm most excited about because I'm, I'm making change outside of my professional career. Well, uh, as a speaker, uh, I, I mean, every, everyone who is a speaker uh, on topics has the pandemics certainly changed a lot of things. Uh, and so uh, maybe those of us that had, mainly spoke in person, got used to being online. For others, being online was the first time that we were able to get out there. Um, how has it uh, been for you? Uh, do you find there are uh, more challenges or that you enjoy one or the other, uh, a virtual experience versus a physical experience? I love that question. So my very first conference that I mentioned earlier, that was in person in 2019. So when I started getting invitations to speak, it was after the pandemic hit. So it just worked out so well. I've always been comfortable with public speaking. However, I like to script out my presentation because it makes me a better speaker. It helps me focus on speaking clearly like I am right now rather than thinking of the next thing I'm going to say. So it was perfect. So I could get the hang of it, get the hang of speaking, 
And then January 20, wait, January 2022, 20, this year, I went to a big, big event and got to speak in person there. But I have been speaking for so long before that point that it was, it was an easy change. I like both, actually. I enjoy in-person events. I do get overwhelmed with other noise, make the hurdles of listening and listening so important to me because I don't, I know what I know. I want to learn from other people. So that, that's why I love online meetings and online events because the quieter people are less likely to talk over each other and you don't have the noises from the network starting with the restaurant. I can hardly get a restaurant anymore because it's taking away the joy of somebody else's company. Well, I, that that's a very uh, useful and interesting perspectives on your experience with that. And uh, Meryl, it's been a pleasure to have the chance to uh, chat with you for a short time here. Hopefully we can uh, meet in the physical world at, at some point, uh, but we'll definitely include information about your activities in the show notes for this program. Thank you so much for having me, Joe. It's a joy to have a conversation with you. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Bye-bye, Meryl. Bye-bye.